This episode is brought to you by Ground News. Ground News is an app that is dedicated to fighting misinformation and bias news, which I think we all know is a bit of a problem in today's media. It's really harder than ever to work out what's really happening in the news. Ground News allows you to filter the news by political bias, so you can jump into the app and see the same story brought to you by a left-wing, center, or right-wing source. This allows you to understand the different perspectives and form your own opinion about what's going on in the world. They've got news from over 40,000 news outlets from around the world, so you can not only see the political bias of a piece of reporting, but also how it might be reported in a different country. Ground News is a free app available from both the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. Just click the link in the description below, and let's get into the video. It was once the greatest city in the hemisphere. In the heartlands of what is now Mexico, the great Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan dominated the landscape. Built atop partially reclaimed land in the middle of a lake, the city was both a marvel of architecture and engineering. Great causeways connected it to the shores, while floating gardens provided sustenance for its citizens. Magnificent temples rose high into the air, sat alongside a palace so luxurious it would make Versailles look like your average Denny's. On the eve of the Spanish conquest, at a time when Europe's greatest cities rarely housed more than 100,000 people, Tenochtitlan was home to a quarter million. But while London and Paris would survive in varying forms in the modern world, Tenochtitlan was doomed to vanish. Ransacked, burned, and built over by the Spanish, it now only exists as ruins. Yet enough records still survive for us to picture what it must have looked like back when it was the capital of a mighty empire. Today we're examining the life and legacy of one of history's greatest cities. At the moment the conquistadors first set foot on Mexico's shores, the Aztec Empire was a booming superpower. Radiating out from its capital of Tenochtitlan, the empire covered 500 separate cities, stretching almost from the Atlantic to the Pacific. With over 6 million inhabitants, it was a state the likes of which Mesoamerica had rarely seen before. And it had all started with the single city of Tenochtitlan. Today we don't know the origin of the Aztecs, only the story they told themselves about it. Around 300 AD, the legend says that they left their homeland of Aztlan following the god Huitzilopochtli for centuries before reaching the Valley of Mexico. Incidentally, they weren't at this stage what we'd call Aztecs, a word they never used themselves, but Mexica, nor were they natural empire builders. The Mexica who arrived in the valley around the 13th century AD were hunter-gatherers with no real knowledge of living in an urban environment. Yet within a span of just a couple of centuries, they had gone from dudes who considered a one-room hut cosmopolitan to dudes in charge of the greatest metropolis on earth. For this transformation, we can blame Huitzilopochtli. Aztec legends held that Huitzilopochtli ordered his priests to search the islands of Lake Texcoco for a place where prickly pear cactuses grew. There, they were to build a temple in his honor. The Mexican priests did as instructed, and lo and behold, the city of Tenochtitlan was born. At the moment of Tenochtitlan's birth, the Valley of Mexico was a melting pot of societies. One of the cradles of the Mesoamerican civilization, the valley had already seen great peoples like the Toltecs rise and fall. Subsequently, it had developed into a region of highly competitive city-states, all trapped in a constant struggle for survival. Imagine a hyper-Darwinian version of ancient Greece, with multiple cities forever warring with one another to gain the slightest advantage. It was a violent world, one in which you either dominated or were dominated. For the Aztecs, it was initially the latter. At this stage, living mostly in huts with their great temple likely built of perishable material, the citizens of Tenochtitlan were forced to submit to the might of the Tepanec Empire and its great capital as Capotzalco. And so the decades dragged by, with those in Tenochtitlan paying tribute to and forever living in fear of their powerful neighbor on the shoreline. But one good thing about living in a highly unstable, highly competitive environment is that nobody stays on top for long. In the early 15th century, as Capotzalco Zalco was rocked by political strife. Seeing their chance, Tenochtitlan allied with nearby Texcoco and the rebel Tepanec city of Tlacopan to overthrow their oppressors. It was a risky gamble, fighting a war with a powerful enemy, but it paid dividends. As Capotzalco fell in its place, the Triple Alliance of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan became masters of the region. The alliance signaled not only the birth of what we call the Aztec Empire, but also the start of Tenochtitlan's meteoric rise. 
As the new empire continued to expand, more and more wealth flooded into the capital. In 1474, the rich trading city of Tlatelolco was captured, placing all of its treasure in Tenochtitlan's hands. It was with these new riches that Tenochtitlan would transform itself into the mightiest city the Americas had ever known. If you were on board a plane that somehow got sucked through a wormhole over Mexico City and reappeared in the skies above Tenochtitlan, what would you see? You know, apart from all the people freaking out about the sudden appearance of a magic metal bird in the sky. Well, the first thing you might notice would be how water-based everything was. Built across two islands, Tenochtitlan was the New World's Venice, with canals crisscrossing its every street. Like Venice, it made use of reclaimed land. Small artificial islands helped expand the city to around 14 square kilometers, while raised earth dikes protected these islands from flooding. But whereas Venice wouldn't be connected to the mainland until well into the 20th century, Tenochtitlan was already joined to the shore. Three great causeways swept out from the capital, each big enough to fit ten horses riding abreast. Elsewhere, a three-kilometer aqueduct ran from the nearby mountains down into artificial reservoirs for storing fresh water. Then there were the floating gardens, mud rocks, Crafts held in place by willow trees, these waterborne fields provided extra space for growing the crops necessary to feed so many people. But while all of this was a fantastic feat of engineering, it likely wouldn't hold your eye for long. That's because the second thing you'd likely notice was the city itself. From high above the grounds in our time-traveling plane, you'd clearly be able to see four districts of the city. Decorated with exotic flower gardens and lined by streets that were wide and regular, each district was almost perfectly ordered. Most of them consisted of low buildings since only the nobility were allowed to build homes of two stories or higher. Try that as a commoner and you'd be summarily executed. Yet there was one major exception to this low building rule the sacred precinct. In the heart of the city, three great pyramids rose into the air, painted a brilliant red and blue with six smaller pyramids standing nearby alongside a ceremonial ball court. But it was the great temple that really made the precinct so awe-inspiring. A twin pyramid structure dedicated to both Huitzilopochtli and the god of rain and fertility, the Templo Mayor, was simply on another scale. Sixty meters tall, it soared into the air, visible from all of the surrounding districts. It was here that the Aztecs indulged in their most famous ritual of all human sacrifice. But we'll come back to that in a minute. For now, let's just enjoy the view from our time-hopping plane and really drink in the city. If you could tear your eyes away from the Templo Mayor long enough, the next thing you'd notice might be the mansions of the nobility culminating in the Emperor's Palace. A vast white building, or rather a complex of buildings, the palace was the last word in Mesoamerican luxury. There were hanging gardens, a whole ten rooms dedicated to keeping birds, a private zoo, pools of both fresh and salt water, and room for 3,000 attendants. Finally, the last thing you might notice before the plane crash due to lack of fuel and landing places was the Grand Market. According to Hernan Cortes, 60,000 people gathered in this open space each day to trade. Yet even at its busiest, Tenochtitlan never appeared as anything less than a clean, well-ordered city, nearly free of crime. So that's our airborne overview of Tenochtitlan. Now let's get down there and find out what life was like for its people. Just as Tenochtitlan itself was ordered and regimented, so too was life for its citizens. The majority held the rank of Mesjuitlin, or commoners. Above them came the Pipleton for nobles, and then the ruling Tetauchtin, while below them sat the Maye, who we'd probably call serfs, and finally, sulking at the bottom, the Tlacatin, or slaves. Each class had its own restrictions on what it was allowed to wear. So while the Pippleton could gad about in elaborate headdresses, the commoners were stuck wearing simple, often revealing outfits. But even within classes, there were differences. For example, merchants were counted as commoners, but were so useful that the city afforded them different privileges. Another point to bear in mind is that the Tlacatin system was very different from American slavery. While being stuck on a southern plantation meant being born into, growing old, and then dying in chains, Aztec slaves were mostly once free commoners who'd committed a crime or sold themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. They had the right to marry whoever they liked, to buy their own freedom, and to be set free if their owner died. Nor could their state of slavery be passed down to their children, unlike the antebellum South. Within this fairly rigid system of class was another rigid system of housing. 
housing. Social organization was done via groupings known as cowpulli, meaning big house. These cowpulli consisted of areas headed by a local Papilton noble. Within these areas, smaller clans were organized around individual neighborhoods, creating a highly visible system of hierarchy. It also allowed for efficient indoctrination. Each neighborhood in Tenochtitlan was required to have a local school where children would, in the words of Montezuma I, learn religion and correct comportment. They are there to do penance, lead hard lives, live with strict morality, practice for warfare, do physical work, fast, endure disciplinary measures, draw blood from different parts of the body, and keep watch at night. While their children were learning all these horrible, important things, their parents would be suffering the curse of adults in every society work. Like the Incas, the Aztecs managed to be technologically advanced while not ever inventing the wheel. That meant there was plenty of work around Tenochtitlan for porters as everything had to be moved by hand. Other major professions for the commoners included farming, weaving, and pottery making. Not that they got paid for any of this, at least not in currency. Tenochtitlan ran on a system of barter, with anything from cacao beans to elaborate feathers to gold dust being used to make purchases. At the higher end of the social scale, people gifted one another incredible silver plants platters and other items designed to scream, hey, aren't I one incredibly rich Aztec dude? But really, all of this was just background noise, because the main motive for activity in Tenochtitlan, the thing that held the social fabric together, was war. Every male could be conscripted to fight, and your place in the social hierarchy rested on how you performed in battle. Capture valuable opponents and your standing would go up. Fail to capture anyone, or only capture weak enemies, and your standing would fall. You'll notice we said capturing rather than killing. There's a good reason for that. The drive behind Aztec warfare, aside from expanding their empire, was a constant burning need for new victims to sacrifice. It's almost impossible to overstate how important this was for their society, how much depended on it. With that in mind, it's time to get to today's most controversial section, the Aztec practice of sacrifice. In the cycle of Aztec creation stories, two stand out as particularly gruesome. One is the birth of the world itself, which involved the blood of the gods creating an eternal blood debt between the earth and the heavens. The other is the origins of humans, in which a Hattel Quetzalcoatl made off with a pile of bones from the underworld and turned them into people, thereby setting up another debt. It was a debt that Aztec culture paid primarily with blood. By the time the Aztecs came along, human sacrifice was already old hat in Mesoamerica. The Olmecs, whose civilization had fallen a full millennium before the Aztecs appeared, indulged in the practice, as did the Toltecs. Like the Aztecs, these societies also practiced non-human sacrifice. For instance, you might stab yourself in the tongue or ear to make a blood offering. Or you might bake a bread image of a god after mixing the dough with honey and blood. Known as Tzali, these effigies would then be eaten after you had performed a ritual. Even lower down the violent scale, meat was sometimes burned as an offering over the statues of gods, as were tobacco and special strips of paper. You could even bury a precious stone in a sacrifice ritual. In other words, there was a whole lot more to Aztec rituals of sacrifice than simply tearing someone's heart out on top of a great temple. That being said, we're also not going to pretend that that didn't happen. The most popular site for these killings was atop Tenochtitlan's Templo Mayor. Rising 60 meters, the Twin Pyramid was the focal point of the city's most important rituals. First dedicated around 1325, the Templo Mayor underwent at least seven building phases as Tenochtitlan grew, growing from a simple structure to the bear moth of legend. The most important additions probably came in the year One Rabbit, or what we would call 1454 AD, when Montezuma I added all sorts of elaborate details. Yet, for a non-local visitor, it probably wouldn't have been the ornately carved serpent heads or sweeping stairways that caught their attention. It would have been the Towers of Skulls. For a long time, these towers were thought to have been myths invented by the conquistadors to justify their destruction of the city. But archaeological digs in 2015 and 2018 uncovered the ruins of these towers, at least one of them boasting over 650 skulls. Thanks to all of this death, the historical Templo Mayor was likely all sorts of gross. As one conquistador wrote, The walls of that shrine were so splashed and caked with blood that they and the floor were black. The stench was worse than that of any slaughterhouse in Spain. Yet we have to remember that this all made sense for Aztec society. It was what all their forerunner civilizations had done. It was what their religion said was necessary to keep the worlds of man and God in balance. It was the reason why they fought so many wars, the foundation on which their culture was built. Asking an ordinary citizen of Tenochtitlan to question sacrifice would be like asking you to question democracy. 
or the Constitution. They just can't imagine civilization working without it. One weird byproduct of this is that sacrifice wasn't always a horror show for Aztec victims. It could also be an honor. Today we have no way of knowing how many people were sacrificed in Tenochtitlan. While conquistador accounts are probably true in a broad sense, they're also probably hopelessly exaggerated. So when a source tells you the Aztec sacrificed an estimated 20,000 a year, it's impossible to know if this is scarily accurate or laughably inflated. But we do know that sacrifice happened routinely, not every day, but often enough that it would have been a feature of local life. The Aztec year was divided into 18 months, each of which had a festival, each of which required sacrifices. However, the type of sacrifice varied wildly depending on which god the festival was dedicated to. The standard version was the one you're probably picturing, someone being stretched out on a stone and having their heart cut out of their chest, but other varieties existed. The festival for Chi Komakotl, for example, involved decapitating a woman and throwing a headless body down the temple steps. If it was Tlaloc's day, on the other hand, the priests would cut the throats of children. And here's where we get to the weirdest part of all. For some of these victims, being chosen was actually an honor. While the majority of victims were prisoners of war, specific feast days involved sacrificing a living effigy of the festival's god. That meant someone had to be picked to be the incarnation of that god on earth. If the god was Tezcatlipoca, that would mean living a life of luxury for a year beforehand with a harem of women at your beck and call. But if the god was Zippe Totec, it would mean mentally preparing yourself to be skinned alive. And this is only the beginning of Aztec ways of offering humans to their hungry gods. Other victims got the Saint Sebastian treatment, tied up and shot full of arrows. Others were repeatedly dropped into and pulled out of fire before having their hearts cut out. Finally, you might be forced to partake in a ritual fight against trained warriors. And fight definitely with air quotes there as it involved taking on a gang of highly trained, highly armed killers while wielding only a feather-coated stick. Sometimes these sacrifices took place one at a time. Sometimes thousands were sacrificed simultaneously. It's stated, although who knows if it's true, that one inauguration festival in 1487 involved the sacrifice of over 50,000 people. When there weren't enough prisoners of war to make up the numbers, the Aztecs got their victims through other means. One way was to ask for volunteers. Citizens who'd committed some grievous sin could volunteer themselves as a sacrifice to make peace with gods. Another way was to turn to the ready population of slaves. Remember earlier when we described how Aztec slaves had more rights than slaves in the American South? Well, that broke down when it came to sacrifice, since offering a slave to the gods was totally something that slave owners could do. Finally, when the priests had run through all of their captives, prisoners, volunteers, and available slaves, they could always turn to the ritual ball games. After these ferocious contests, the captain of the losing team would be sent to meet his maker, but these exceptions were relatively rare. By and large, it was enemy warriors who met their end atop the Templo Mayor, with the best fighters and most handsome soldiers thought to be particularly pleasing to the gods. Once they were dead, their flesh might be cooked and eaten by the priests or gifted to local community leaders. Archaeologists have found human bones with distinct signs of cannibalism. All in all, then, sacrifice was a major part of life in Tenochtitlan, a crazy, vital part that animated every section of the city. It was also what would bring about its ultimate downfall. If you ever wonder what it might look like if humans came into contact with a more technologically advanced society, look no further than what happened to the Aztecs in 1519. That year, Hernan Cortes and his conquistadors came marching into Mexico, killing and looting and burning. By November, they'd reached Tenochtitlan. Although the conquistadors came from a European great power, the Aztec capital still blew them away. Welcomed by the Emperor Montezuma II, and we have a video on his story on our sister channel Biographics if you fancy some homework, the Spanish wandered the streets in a daze. They'd simply never seen anywhere this big before, never seen anywhere this grand. The great Spanish cities were jumped-up toy towns compared to this. As he was shown Tenochtitlan's beautiful flower gardens and great temples, Cortes called the city an enchanted vision. He also began making plans to present it intact to Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. 
But then the Spanish witnessed their first Aztec sacrifice ritual, and things went sideways pretty fast. Again, this is a moment where we bump up against the fact that most surviving accounts of this collision of cultures were written by the Spanish, who naturally presented themselves as dashing heroes. But it's not like the conquistadors weren't butchers themselves. On their long journey into the Aztec interior, they'd massacred entire towns that stood against them. Nonetheless, there's evidence that Tenochtitlan's ritual sacrifice really did sicken something deep inside the Spanish soul, even if it was only outrage at non-Catholic worship. Only a few days after being admitted to the great city, Cortes and his men took Montezuma II hostage. Using him as a puppet ruler, they tore down the altars atop Templo Mayor, installing a giant cross in their place. It was about as explosive as aliens landing in New York and tearing down the Statue of Liberty while wiping their butts with the American flag. Tensions in Tenochtitlan reached a boiling point. It would be a final sacrifice ceremony that sent them spilling over. One hot night in May of 1520, as the sound of drums filled the air and warriors adorned with feathers danced in the sacred precinct in preparation for a sacrifice, a great commotion went up. The Spanish came charging in, swords drawn. They slaughtered the unarmed locals until, as one surviving Aztec source put it, the blood of the warriors flowed like water. It was the beginning of the end for the Aztec capital. The city exploded in revolt against the Spanish, leading to bloodshed on a grand scale. On June 30, 1520, the conquistadors fled to avoid being massacred. Hundreds of them were either killed as they ran or else drowned in the lake and marshes surrounding Tenochtitlan, some pulled under the waters by piles of treasure that they were trying to carry. Unfortunately for Tenochtitlan, far too many of them survived. Less than a year later, in April 1521, Cortes returned with reinforcements, including armies composed of former Aztec subjects. In the subsequent battle, Cortes forgot all about gifting this great, shining city to his emperor. Tenochtitlan was almost totally destroyed, burned down in the fighting, and what survived was ransacked by the victorious Spanish. They then founded a new city atop the ruins, turning what was once a strange, magnificent place into another colonial outpost. It was from this outpost that Mexico City eventually grew. Today, Tenochtitlan exists as only a handful of ruins in the middle of Mexico City's sprawl. While interesting, these destroyed temples are barely a shadow of what they once were, little more than a stone reminder that a magical city once stood here. Incredible as it seemed to the Spanish, this was a capital city at the center of a great civilization that grew up completely separated from Eurasia. At a time when few believed real culture could exist outside of Europe or the Middle East, Tenochtitlan stood as one of the greatest urban settlements on the planet, bigger than Paris, grander than Constantinople, and more beautiful than Rome. Yes, it was a city with a dark side, but it was also a fantastic feat of architecture and engineering. More than that, it was home home to a quarter million ordinary people who lost everything when the conquistadors came. The destruction of Tenochtitlan may have been a breathtaking act of cultural vandalism, but it's comforting to know that its memory still survives. That even now, half a millennium later, we can look back on its legacy and admire one of the greatest cities in human history. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor for this video, Grounds News, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.